What an exciting time in Philadelphia, huh? Wow. The birds. Huh? The birds, huh? How good is that? Now, I know, I know you're all looking dignified here, but I see a few of you down at the stadium. And I've watched you. I know there's a few mainliners here, but you think we can get kind of eagle happy here this morning? Can we do that? All right, let's hear it. E A G L E S Eagles! Yes! All right. I'm excited. I'm excited today because my friend is here. My brother is here. And he's got a story to tell. But I get the microphone first. I want to brag on him. Pro Bowl, 91, 92, 93. His, he got there because of his strengths and his quickness. They called him the hammer. When Seth hit you, it was like you went into next week. <laughs> the greatest goal line stance in the history of football. Now, I can imagine, I can imagine a defense stopping, you know, a, a strong running back and a good team once, you know, on a goal line, maybe twice. Wouldn't you agree? that that would be, you know, still quite a feat. But Seth Joyner, one day, was in the huddle. And he said, boys, these guys are not going to get in the end zone. Do you hear me? And not only did they try once, or twice, or three times, or four times, or five times, or six, but seven times, Seth Joyner and his buddies, Reggie White and, and uh, Simmons and all the guys, they, they stopped him, Jerome Brown. and So just unbelievable, the greatest goal line stance in the history of football. Monday night football, 102 degree fever. Monday night, 102 degree fever. Let me tell you what happened on Monday night. Eight solo tackles, two forced fumbles, two fumble recoveries, and two sacks. When he had a 102 degree fever. I can't imagine getting hit by that guy when he doesn't have a fever. <laughs> He's got a Super Bowl ring. It looks pretty cool, too. It's really nice. You know, I was down at the Masters one year, and I and, uh, got invited by some friends or whatever, and I was standing next to the tee with Tiger Woods hit a ball, and I, I'm a, I'm a you know, wannabe golfer, and I heard a sound on that club that I, it was just foreign to me. It, man, it was like a missile going off. I couldn't believe I said, what was that? Well, I golfed with Seth, and the first time I golfed with him, I'll never forget it. It took me back to the Masters. This guy hit this golf. I could hear the golf ball screaming, no! <laughs> no. My son John, 6'5", 340 pounds, played ball also, and I was in the kitchen one day, and I was at the refrigerator. He came up behind me, Mark, and put his arms around me, and picked me up and said, what are you going to do now, Dad? I said, well, I still got the keys and all the money. He said, oh, good Dad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said, oh, good Daddy. <laughs> I said, you're a wise son. You know, and I know Herb's, I know uh, Seth's pastor, Herb Lusk, and Herb said to me, Jim, he said, let me tell you something about Seth. As big and strong as he is, there's one person that can look at him in the eye and say, sit down there, boy. I want to talk to you. I don't like what you just said. And that's his mother. <laughs> and uh, his mother did an unbelievable job. So ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce my brother and my friend, Seth Jordan. Let's give it up for him. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to you all. First off, I would like to acknowledge um, Jim Maxson. I met Jim through Pastor Herb Lusk, and in all my years of knowing him, he's one of the most gracious people that I've ever known. Um, 
not just a good friend, but someone always willing to share his faith with you. And I like to just recognize him this morning because I'm here with this opportunity that God has placed before me to share my, not just my story, but the love of Christ with you this morning. Um, you guys gave me a round of applause. Please give my good friend a round of applause. The other gentleman that is responsible for me being here is en route, Pastor, Pastor Herbert Lusk. Um, Jim mentioned him early, earlier. He and Jim are like this. At, at, on the golf course, in their service to God, and in pe people for people, and the Hope Center, Jim is very involved with what they do. It's near and dear to me as well because I've known Pastor, Pastor Lust for 35 years, about as long as his ministry has been up on 700 Broad Street. And what I've seen God do through him up there is phenomenal. And there was a point in time where no one traveled north of City Hall almost. And I can remember the first time I went to that church, the church was in shambles, falling apart. You know, Reggie was the conduit, he took us up, and we would go up and minister at the church and help her about, and I was just wondering how in the world is this church gonna grow? And 35 years later, you can see the power of God in that ministry to see what it is that they've done there. It's, it's been amazing. So what I'd like to do, they have their 28th gala, gala on November 7th at the Bellevue. And Pastor Lusk isn't here yet, but I'm sure once he gets here, I will acknowledge him and ask him to stand. It is a worthy, worthy cause for anyone to be involved with because he is truly doing God's work. Would love for you guys to get involved in any way that you can. So, I can't begin this talk today if I don't pray first, because I got a whole bunch of notes here <laughs> and, a, and a little bit of time. And normally what happens is you prepare all of this information, and then the Holy Spirit shows up <laughs> and messes up all that you prepare for. <laughs> so I know it's going to happen. So I'm just going to close my eyes right now. Will you pray with me and just ask him to come on and have his way, whatever he wants me to say. <laughs> Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share with this assembly what it is that you've done in my life, what you've meant to my life. I thank you for your son. Cannot repay in any way, Heavenly Father, so I say thank you for the grace and the mercy that you've shown me. And I pray your Holy Spirit will come and have his way. Not these mortal words that I've wrote down on pen and paper, but the message that you would have your people who have gathered here this morning to hear. Holy Spirit, have your way. I step aside. Use me how you see fit. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of information here, and if there's one thing, if you don't take anything else away from this talk this morning, God wants me to tell you that he loves you. He loved you so much that he gave his son to redeem you to himself. Now going forward, I got three points that I want to make. One, I want to talk about my life before I knew Jesus. How I came to be reacquainted 
with Jesus and what Jesus now means to my life, my all in all. Now, I, I have to be transparent. I, I do these talks and this, I get an opportunity to um, do motivational stuff and leadership stuff and peak performance things. But when you have an opportunity to talk about your Lord and Savior, it's a whole different, it's a whole different deal. And the thing I, I have to do is there has to be some transparency in what I talk about. Because not every believer has always been saved. Not every believer has always been right with God. That's a fallacy because we see men of God, women of God, and we think that they're supposed to be holier than thou, like Jesus. And we all know that the only perfect person that ever walked the face of this earth is Jesus. Sin is within their DNA. Sin is within all of our DNAs. If we come from Adam and Eve, when they fell, their DNA was fractured. That means that each and every one of us has that same DNA running through us. So I do not stand before you being pharisaic or being sadducitic. I stand before you to be real today. And let's be honest, you know, Peter had his issues. We know the story of Peter. He all kinds of issues and problems. Okay? And if God could do what he did through Peter, who denied him, who was one minute praised for having revelation of who he was through the Holy Spirit, and the next minute just about calls Satan himself, get behind me. If he could do that with him, what, what can he do with us? Yes. So Peter had his thorn. I've got my thorn. We all have our thorns. Listen, I've been some places and I've done some things I'm not proud of in my life. But God, the love of God and the blood of Jesus has covered and redeemed me. And that's what gives me the right, the opportunity, the power through the Holy Spirit to come before you and speak to death. I know the hand of God has always been on my life. I give you a, I'm driving one night, going someplace I have no business being, with someone I have no business being with, And it's cold out, below freezing. And the car hits a patch of ice, black ice, and it starts to spin. Now, you know the first thing that came out of my mouth, right? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> the car spun three times. And every time it spun, Jesus came out of my mouth. And when the car came to rest, we were traveling north. When the car came to rest, we were still in the right lane, facing north. And when I rolled down the window to get my bearings, I put my hand outside the window, and I touched the telephone pole. I couldn't even open the door. That's how close I was to the telephone pole. I mean, I could literally stick my hand out and touch the telephone pole. Now, you tell me that the hand of God has not been on my life. Because, and I can give you many, many more stories, but I want to be transparent with you because people always look at the finished product. As an ex-professional football pe player, people look at me and think that I got it all together. 
I'm a work in progress, even after all these years. A pastor once said, the service was over one day, and a young woman came to him and said, I need you to pray. Pray for my three kids, that they learn and grow in God, and God would protect them. Well, the pastor said, well, let me pray for you. She said, oh, no, 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 no. Don't want you to pray for me. I just want you to pray for my kids. I've done so many things and been so many places in my life. There's no way that God can love me. Some of the things that I've done, some of the places I've been. The pastor looks at her and he goes, come to my study. We need to sit and talk about this for a minute. So they go to the study, and he begins to inquire about the issues. And she, she turns to him and says, Pastor, listen, I've already told you that there's no way that God can love me, some of the things I've done, some of the places I've been. I need you to just pray for my kids that they would know the love of Christ. Well, the pastor looked at her and said, do you think I've been a pastor my entire life? He began to tell her some of the things that he's done and some of the places that he's been and what his life was like before he knew Jesus. And everything that he tells her, I mean, she's sitting there and her head is down and she looks dejected. And every time he reveals one, one thing to her, her stature grows up a little bit and her head raises up a little more and her eyes become brighter. And by the time he's done telling her what his past was like, she looks at him. She said, oh, pastor, pray for me now. Pray for me now. I know if Jesus brought you to, to the ministry, I know he can fix and save me. So life before I knew Jesus, that's kind of a misnomer because I grew up in the church my entire life from the time that I could be carried into a church as a baby, I've been in the church. Like I said before, he's always been a big part of my life and he's always been a part of my life. He's always been with me, but I haven't always been with him. Growing up in the church, you know, I worked in the church. By the time, you know, you turn 12, 13 in my house, you was either going to sing or you were going to be an usher. <laughs> I was happy to put on that black suit and tie <laughs> once a month. The thing about the church, though, that as a young person that, that kind of troubled me is that fear was the driving force. I grew up in a Baptist church. My aunt had 11 kids, and we loved to be at her house. And she went to a Pentecostal charismatic church. You talk about two ends of the spectrum, huh? And the predominant thing in both churches at that time was the preachers would preach from the pulpit fire and brimstone, this sense of fear all the time. Now on Christmas, Christmas and, and, and Easter, you know, you get John 3.16, for God so loved the world. But I was a little bit conflicted because I grew up with this thought in my head that God was always mad. You know, he's mad at me. You, you, I mean, that's just the way it was back then. They wanted to point out your guilt, and they wanted to point out your shame, and they wanted to point out your condemnation. But they never wanted to tell you that, look, that God loves you and that Jesus has covered all of your sins, past, present, and future, with his blood. The other part is the lack of teaching knowledge. It's not a knock on those preachers of that day. But, and maybe it was just me. Maybe I wasn't receiving what it was that they were sharing. So I went away to college at 17 years old. 
And in my, in my house, you, you had to go to church. So even when you got older, you had to go to Sunday school and you had to go to church afterwards. And there were benefits to going to church every Sunday now. You know, every once in a while you could go to movies on Sunday. You know, you could watch football all day Sunday. You could go out and play after church. But if you didn't go to church, none of that stuff was available to you. <laughs> so my, my mother was a master motivator to get us to go to church. So when I went away to college at 17 years old, quite frankly, church was the last thing on my mind. Being forced to go to church, being spoon-fed a God that, that's mad at you and upset with you. When I got to college, I pretty much ran from God as if I could really run from God, really. <laughs> Jesus said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Even in times where you forsake him and leave him, he's always there. For you parents, I want to share with you a statistic that when your kid goes away to college, it's the most vulnerable time of his faith. Have a conversation with your kids when they leave your house and go away to college. Because there's a, a statistic that over 65% of the Christian kids that go away to college, those four years is where they forget about Jesus, move away from Jesus, and influenced by so many other things that they walk away from the faith. Two, how I came to know Jesus. I always knew who he was. I was just scared of him. So Reggie White was a big, big influence in an indirect kind of a way. Because when I came to Philadelphia, Reggie was on fire for Jesus. And can you imagine a locker room with 53 grown men, a bunch of 20-something-year-olds, and Reggie, six foot five, 295 pounds, preaching Jesus to you all day long? <laughs> I, you know, I, our locker room was a very dynamic place because there were a lot of different characters, and we revered Reggie. You know, most of us came from households where we grew up in the church. We were raised to respect the pastor, and we had one on our team. <laughs> so while Reggie was trying to save us, 20-something-year-old with a little bit of money in our pocket, a little bit of notoriety, the ears were shut, hearts was hardened, eyes were closed, blind to the truth, and we couldn't receive what he had to give. And it caused some friction for a while. And Reggie came in one day, he said, listen, I'm here for you when you need me. And the dynamics of our team and our locker room began to shift when he stopped trying to force feed us and just said, I'm here for you when you need me. He started Bible studies and trying to lead as many of his teammates that were ready for it to Christ. I wish Herb was here. I know he's on his, on his way. But I got I to gotta share this with you. You know, by the time I got to the league, you know, I was living my dream, not really realizing that God had blessed that dream. And from the time I was 12 years old, I knew what I wanted to do. And God blessed that, that dream, that seed that was within me. I wrote when I was 12 years old, when I grow up, I want to... I'm going to be a professional football player, and I'm going to buy my mother a new house and a new car. <laughs> and that, I wrote that essay when I was in school. Didn't really understand that, you know, when you, when you write something like that and you put your name on it, you are basically signed a contract with yourself, setting a goal. 
and you put yourself in a position where you have to do all the things that are necessary to get there, whether you realize it, whether you're conscious of it or not, you know, because in a lot of ways you can lie to yourself. You can lie to a lot of people. The one person you can't lie to is yourself. So as my career began to take off, some things around me began to happen. You know, with, especially with Reggie and some of the guys on the team. And, you know, there was this time where, you know, guys would score a touchdown or do something big and they would point to God or they'd take a knee. And in my ignorance, I would look at that. I'm like, why do those guys, it, it bothered me. I took offense to it, if you will, out of ignorance. It's like, why do those guys have to wear their faith on their sleeve? I couldn't understand it. And God's just got a way of bringing you around because Herb Lusk used to play for the Philadelphia Eagles for Dick Vermeil back in the 70s. And every time Herb would score a touchdown, he'd take a knee and pray in the end zone. Isn't God funny how he pairs you up with somebody? He became known as the, pray, the praying running back. Wound up being my best friend and gave me some insight on why he was doing that, and then it made sense to me. Ultimately, God began to draw me in because the scripture said, man, you cannot come to me unless I draw you, okay? So he began to draw me in over time. My life was out of control. A lot of things began to happen, good and bad for me. And as I began to grow up and I began to change, God began to, began to draw me in. I live in Arizona, and I finally found a church that spoke to me. A pastor there, Dr. Joseph Kern, his teaching spoke to me in a way where those words were applicable to my life, to my everyday life. When I was growing up, the preacher would preach and I couldn't see how I could take what he was saying and apply it to my life. But all of a sudden, this preacher began to preach and teach. And I began to understand that God wasn't mad at me. I began to understand the magnitude of what Jesus did on Calvary for me. I began to understand that the hand of God was on my life even when I wasn't in church, and even when I was running from God. I began to understand that God honors his promises. If you read them in the book of Deuteronomy, throughout the book, God has promises for those who love him. Promises are there. And if I can't take God at his word, if I can't take him at his promise, then what can I believe him for? And what I've come to understand and realize that no matter what's going on in my life, good, bad, or indifferent, he always brings peace. He always brings calm. It might not be the way that I want it, but he always makes it right. So in my church, I, began, I got involved, became a deacon in my church, took a course that we have in our church called Armor Bearers, it's a discipleship program. And we have a, a, a university in our church, Radiant University. So I finished the discipleship program, entered into Radiant program, which is, which is a year beyond, and the information is so intense, by the time you get done with it in two and a half, three years, you've almost gone through seminary, if you will. So through this, God's word really began to start to talk to me again. I was inspired to seek God and seek his word. And the funny thing that I know about God's word is the more that I seek it, after a while it begins to seek me. The more I study it, the more revelation it reveals. It began to speak to me in ways that it never spoke to me before. I could open up a Bible and read and read and read and read, and it had, it had no, 
Every once in a while you get a sentence that meant something to you. But all of a sudden I opened up the Bible and it felt like the words just leapt off the page and just went in my spirit and all of a sudden it started to make sense. The more I prayed, the more I read, the more Jesus spoke to me. He talked to me about his love. He talked to me about his plans for me. He talked to me about his plans for my life. I'm always drawn to Isaiah 53 and 4. It's tough for me to read it sometimes because it's extremely It's graphic, but when you read it, you really understand the magnitude of what Jesus has done for us. It says he was wounded for our transgressions. That means that every time that you transgress the word and the law of God, he took a strike for you. He was bruised for my iniquity. Every sin. He took a bruise for it. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. In other words, he knew no peace that I would know peace. And by his stripes, we are healed. Now, that word heal is in the future tense or past tense word. That's a present tense word. Anybody in here that has any kind of sickness, any kind of situation. You might not know it yet, but you are, you are healed because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now I implore you each and every day when you get up, read that, begin to speak that until it sits in your, in your, in your spirit. Again, if I can't take him at his word, then what can I take him at? For the longest, I've always said, I don't get sick. I don't get sick. Because of that scripture, I don't get sick. I got a 16-year-old son. Since the time he was able to walk, you know, I don't get sick. You can ask him today. He's 16 years old. <coughs> you getting sick? I don't get sick. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. You know, when you're... The enemy doesn't want you to know the power that is within you. When we sin or we're not doing what we're supposed to do, I talked about it earlier, the funny thing is we run from God. We do something wrong, we run from God. You know, when I was a kid, I'd do something wrong and we lived in this two-bedroom apartment and my mom would be upset with me. And I try to hide from her in this little two bedroom apartment. <laughs> Not realizing that, you know, if I needed some water, I had to see her. If I had to go to the bathroom, I had to see her. If it wasn't too bad and I wasn't on punishment from TV, I had to see her. And that no matter how mad she was at me, deep down, I knew that that woman loved us with every fiber of her being. My son is the same way. He's smartened up, though. I could be mad at him, and he'll go to his room for a short time, and while I'm watching TV, he'll come in, and he'll sit down right next to me, and he'll just lay his head on my shoulder. <laughs> That's kind of how we are with God sometimes, isn't it? When we're not doing what we're supposed to do, we run as if we can run away from God. You know, what God wants you to do is run to him in that time. Because his love for, for you never changes. No matter what you do, it never changes. What he wants for you to do is come to him and repent. What he wants for you to come to, to, come to him and confess your sin. His word says he's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful to forgive you. 
So why run around, walk around with that condemnation on your heart, on your life? Walking, running from God as if you can, because he's, if he's omnipotent, if he's omniscient, if he's omnipresent, then you can't get away from him, even if you try. So now my life with Jesus, hallelujah. My all in all, how he's changed my life. So now, see, now I have a relationship with God. I have a relationship with Jesus. I know that he sits at the right hand of the Father. He intercedes on my behalf all the time. It's like walking into a courtroom if you really stop and think about it. And Jesus is your defense attorney. God is the judge. And the enemy's over here. He's accusing you and he's defending you. That's what you have. Seated in heavenly places. I feel his presence every day of my life. Even right now, I feel the presence of God in this place. His Holy Spirit is present. He said, when I go to the Father, I will send another. He that will guide you and direct you and counsel you and lead you into all truth. And that's what he does. If you pray, before you read your Bible, it's, it's amazing because God continues to open up these opportunities for me to share. So I was just in El Paso, Texas, two weeks ago. I was inducted in the University of Texas, El Paso, where I went to school, Hall of Fame. So after the dinner, some of the athletes, thank you. Some, some of the, a couple of the athletes were, we were sitting downstairs in the lobby and we were talking. And it was late. The event got done at about 11 o'clock. We were sitting about 1 o'clock in the morning. We're talking and reminiscing about the, the old days at, at the TEP. And the young lady that was working at the bar, she closed. And a man, uh, her husband walked in at the time. We, I didn't know it was her husband. So he kind of overheard us talking. We were talking everything about family and relationships, and we were talking about God, and, you know, it, it, was just, it was just amazing. Well, when everybody left, the guy walks up to me and grabs me by the arm, and he's got 101 questions about God. Now, it's 1.30 in the morning, and I was ready to go to sleep. But in that moment, I said, okay, God, I see what you're doing. And this is a young man that prays, that believes in God, has a problem with faith. He's like, how do you know, though? How do you know? I said, because before this night is over, I'm going to pray for you because I want you to have an experience with Jesus. That's how you're going to know. I said, I know because I've had an experience with him. I know because I shouldn't be here having this conversation with you right now. I said, every two to five seconds, you draw a breath. Do you worry about it? He's like, no. I was like, so by faith, you believe that you're going to get another breath to sustain, sustain your life, right? He goes, yeah. It's like, you mean to tell me that you can't believe in the one who gives you that breath? I mean, we went at it for, to about 4.30 in the morning now. <laughs> and you want to know the thing about it? As, as tired as I thought I was, by the time I got done, I was so energized, I couldn't even go to sleep. It was, it was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. I'm sure he didn't get no sleep that night either. <laughs> which I'm all right with. I hope that the Holy Spirit wrestled with him and flipped and turned him all night long until he got it. So I'm positive in the assuredness that Christ is always with me, that the victory is mine. It's already won. I know God opens doors that no man can shut for me, and I know he closed doors that no man can reopen. 
He's with me when I work. I love to golf. He's with me when I golf. <laughs> He's with me in my business ventures, my relationships. And I know that to be a fact because in my walk, the Holy Spirit will reveal some things about you. My entire life, I've had this issue with anger. I grew up in an angry house. My mom was raised in the South in the 30s and the 40s. So she had a chip. I don't know how, only by God's grace am I, am I at this place that I am in my, in, in, at, at this time. But anger was a prevalent thing in my house. And while that anger served me well on the football field, I could channel it. It never served me well in everyday life. And the thing about the enemy, he knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what your triggers are. He knows what you're tempted by. And at every turn, at every turn, he'll try to trigger that anger thing in me. And when I didn't understand and I didn't know it before God revealed it to me, you ever, y'all ever play badminton? What's that little thing called? It's called a birdie, right? What is it? A, sh a shuttlecock. I would have never known that. <laughs> so before I understood what the enemy was doing with me, it was like, you know, he was just playing badminton with me. Over here and over there, I get mad about this and mad about that. And then when God revealed to me what he was really doing, I was like, ah, okay. Not that I got it mastered, I'm working on it still. Okay, but now I know when he starts to try to incite a riot inside of me, I know exactly what he's up to. Now I just laugh at him. I'm like, no, 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 no more. People say I'm worry free, unfazed by major issues in life, calm in the storm. I know it's nothing more than. Jesus in my life. My mom passed away five years ago. It was one of the most difficult things for me to witness and see because she passed away over a period of time. So I live in Arizona and she was in North Carolina and I would go to North Carolina for two or three weeks at a time and then I'd go home for a week and then I'd come back. And towards the end, towards the end, she lost considerable weight, and I looked up in the sky and said, God, I know that you can do anything, all things. I said, if it's your will, heal her. But if it's your will to take her home, I said, please take her home, because this is becoming more than I can bear. So two nights later, I was sitting next to her and I felt her draw her last breath. And there was a calm that sat over me that I've never known since then. A couple of months later, my sister was really struggling with, with it. And she called me. And I began to pray for, for her, that God would give her peace and the Holy Spirit said, you know, you ask God to heal her. Never thought about it in these terms. He said, what makes you think she's not healed? He says, as a matter of fact, she's healed. She's whole. She'll never know pain again. She's got on her incorruptible. And she's better than she's ever been. That brought another piece. And then he revealed to me, and you'll see her again. Now that's what he gave to me to share with my sister because she was struggling. And I said, listen, you grew up in the church, you sing in the choir, you got your kids in the church every single Sunday. And you get on your knees and you pray and you ask God to give you peace about this thing. Because I promise you, he does not want you fretting like this. 
So I know that he loves me. He loves you. He wants to be your comfort, your peace, your joy, your everything. But one thing about Jesus is he's not going to twist your arm and make you do anything. It's like being in a relationship with someone. Do you want them to love you because they truly love you? Or do you want them to twist your arm and make you love you? So all that he offers, he offers freely. Freely he has given to me. Today, freely I stand before you offering what it is that he offers. So in closing, I would ask you to ask yourself, solemnly ask yourself this question. If Jesus showed up tomorrow, if Jesus came tomorrow, where would you spend eternity? Let me give you five seconds just to ponder that. If you're unsure, if there's any doubt, today, I want to introduce you to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to experience, Jesus wants you to experience his unconditional love, his grace, his mercy. He says, by grace... He's given to me freely, freely I'm sharing with you because I've been redeemed. You can be redeemed. He justifies me so no man can bring back upon me and talk to me about the things that I've done in my past. When people do, I just point to Jesus. Hey, you take it up with him. (laughs) That's the old me. You can take up that guy with Jesus. He wants you to know he's waiting patiently, but time is of the essence. He says he forgives your sins. and He wants to set you free from guilt, shame, and condemnation. See, the enemy wants you to hold, he wants to hold you there. He wants you to feel less than. He wants you to feel like that woman felt before the pastor revealed his past. He wants you to feel like there's no hope. That God is mad at you. That he's not for you. He's against you. He wants you to feel that way. And I leave you with this scripture. Romans 8, 1. His word said, There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, for the law, never, I never knew this, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Do you know what that means? That means that there's a law of, the, there's a law of a spirit of life, of eternal life in Christ. That law has nullified the old law. It says, has made you free from the law of sin and death. That's what Jesus Christ offers you today. His word still speaks even today because he doesn't want any that the father has given him in his hand to perish. My time is up, but I want to call up Jim. And I don't know if um, Pastor Lusk is here or not yet, but I think I'd be remiss in my duties if I didn't offer those who are here outside of God's ark of safety an opportunity to come to Christ today, an opportunity to say yes to Jesus today, an opportunity at eternal life today. So Jim, come on, come up please. And what I'd like to do um, I think Jim told me that there's a prayer leader at each table. And I would like what I would like for Jim to do is to lead you in a sinner's prayer. See, people try to make God so complicated. It's 
pretty easy. There's words and belief in your heart. The word says if you believe in your, with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is the son of the living God, that he came and died and redeemed us all, if you, can believe, if, you, if you can believe it in your heart and you confess it, can confess it with your mouth, it's that simple. You will be saved. It's that easy. It's not complicated. God's not that complicated. Okay? Now, you got some other things to do, get in a good church, get, get your Bible and get closer to God and nourish that relationship. But first things first, let's work on the believing and the confessing so that you can have what God wants with you, wants for you. I thank you and I yield to Jim as we have this time where you can come. If you need prayer, I would invite you to come. Because there's nothing like the power of prayer in agreement. In agreement. The word says wherever two or three or more agree, touching, Okay, I'm there. Christ is there. Okay? So we can come in agreement. But the most important thing before I step off the stage is I want, Jim, if there's someone here that doesn't know Christ, that doesn't understand the love of Christ, I implore you today to come forward, step up, accept Jesus. It'll be the greatest move that you've ever made in your life. I thank you. Seth, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, my brother, for being so transparent and letting that love of God shine through you so brightly. Seth said that Jesus was always with him, but he wasn't always with Jesus. Well, today, as Seth so eloquently and powerfully stated, God's not mad at you. God loves you. This is a very special moment. This can be a defining moment in your life. There's no embarrassment here today. We're all sinners saved by Jesus Christ. Nobody wants, I don't want anybody looking in my closet and my closet's under the blood of Christ. I've been forgiven. But let's bow our hearts and bow our heads in prayer, please, right now. And I'm going to ask you, if, if you've never asked Christ in your life, if you want to settle it once and for all, if today is the day that you really want to settle it in this time of this reverent, reverential time, where you know God's presence is here amongst us. I want you to say this prayer after me. Say it quietly in your heart or whatever. I don't, I'm not interested in embarrassing you. This is not a time of embarrassment. But I want you to say this prayer. If you, if you want to settle it once and for all, that you know, that you can know for sure that you have been forgiven. I want you to say this. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I come to you today. Father, I heard Seth's words clearly. And Father, I'm asking you today in the name of Jesus to forgive me of my sins. God, I've been running too long. And Father, today, right now, Father, would you please forgive me? Would you please cleanse me, God? Father, in the name of Jesus, I surrender myself to you. You see what I've done. You see how vile I've been. But God, I'm asking you to cleanse me and forgive me. Take this from me, God. Please, God, take this from me. Father, please forgive me for what I've done. Please, God, forgive me. Forgive me, God. In the name of Jesus, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. God, I ask you to forgive me. And Jesus, please come into my heart right now. Jesus Christ, please come into my heart right now. Please, and help me and give me the strength to serve you. In your holy and precious name, I pray. 
And if you're a Christian and you're here and you just haven't been walking with God and you know that there's things that you got to get right with God, say this prayer in your heart. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see me. God, I accept this as you led me here today. It's no coincidence. And God, I ask that you forgive me. And Father, I have felt your love before, but God, I have transgressed your love. Forgive me, God. Forgive me, God. Cleanse me. Renew a right spirit within me, O God. Help me to serve you, God. Give me the strength, God, to serve you. Please, God, give me the strength to serve you. In Jesus' name.